just a little bit from Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 13, Marlon, if you want to put that up. I uh, really will be happy to have a screen in the back again. We have, about two weeks now, we've been visualists. The thing up there uh, just kind of wiggled out on us. and So I'm trying that TV screen to see how it works. And I hope that it does work. If it don't work, we'll take it down. And we'll do something else. I don't know what. But we'll, we're going to get it fixed. Because when I'm standing here looking at y'all, I really am not looking at y'all. I'm looking at that screen. Amen. To see what Marlon has on it. But I'll read from the pages that I have right here this evening. This is, this is a little description here of some experiences that the Apostle Paul had as he... Man, you talk about life-changing events. He's, he's, he's the poster boy for that being changed the way he was by the Lord Jesus. But in the 13th verse of Acts chapter 17, maybe just a point or two in this text of Scripture, it'll suffice for this evening, hopefully, and be, be, be good to hear. But verse 13, it says, When the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the people. Now just for your enlightenment or your information or whatever, you may not even need it, but the Thessalonica, those, those people at Thessalonia were really, had previously given Paul a very, very hard time with his ministry. And it was almost impossible for him to minister effectually in Thessalonica. <coughs> but Paul moved on. He went to another place called Berea. And as he preached there, <coughs> excuse me, it says that those Jews of Thessalonica heard that he was preaching the Word of God there. And so they traveled from Thessalonica to Berea to give Paul a hard time again. Verse 14 says, Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timothy, these were two men that traveled with Paul, they abode at Berea. They stayed there. They sent Paul away. Verse 15, they that conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now this is the part of this reading here tonight that I'm going to spend just a few moments emphasizing here some things that Paul says in here. While he is at Athens in Greece, this is the world's hub, Athens, for the worship, the creation of gods of all sorts, sizes and shapes and divinities. My goodness gracious, they had gods of sun and stars and moons and clouds and thunder. They just had gods strung all over the universe. And Athens was that focal point for all of that dissemination and all of that worship of idolatrous gods. Paul finds himself in the midst of Athens. Verse number 16, it says, His spirit was stirred in him while he saw the whole city given to idolatry. His spirit was stirred in him. And sometimes, church, when you see things, your spirit, I don't know exactly what to say about that, but 
I know there's a scripture that talks about Lot and his situation in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it speaks of the vaccine that he felt in his soul when he saw the goings on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And sometimes, church, when you see things in this world that people are doing, people are involved in, sometimes the Spirit will stir within you and you'll think, oh my. And then sometimes you just think, boy, if I could fix or change any of that, I would sure give it a try. But Paul, as he found himself there, he said, verse 17, he disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons in the market daily and them that met with him, he disputed with them. Now the dispute has to do with worship. The dispute that Paul is involved in with Jews and even those who aren't Jews but are worshipers of idols, that's what the dispute is about. And he met, he met with them daily in the market and he disputed with them. And it says in verse 18, the philosophers, the Epicureans, the Stoics, they encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Speaking of Paul. Other, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of, a, of strange gods. <coughs> because he preached unto them Jesus. And he preached the resurrection. They thought as they heard him preach that the God he was preaching about was strange or foreign. They heard him preach Jesus and they heard him preach the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now one thing that I believe caused some of this stir was that the gods that prevailed in Athens during that day and time were really helpless, weak. Those gods that they had established in Athens couldn't raise the dead. Those gods couldn't talk. They couldn't think. They could do nothing miraculous. Those gods that they were so accustomed to worshiping did nothing like Jesus did. And I'm sure that the Apostle Paul, when he preached Jesus, preached not only that Jesus himself was raised from the dead, but that Jesus raised the dead, and that further Jesus was going to raise more dead. And that Jesus was the healer of sick people. He cleansed lepers. He healed bone diseases. There was a woman about over 18 years and the Lord just said, seeing that you're a daughter of Abraham, you ought to be free. He just commanded the devil to let her go. And I'm sure when Paul preached, he preached all of these wonderful things that Jesus said and Jesus did. And the people in Athens had never heard anything about a God like this. So they just said, well, he's just setting forth a strange, a strange teaching. We don't, we listen, we're comfortable with our idols. We're comfortable with our temples. We're comfortable with nothing happening anywhere at any time. But church, when you are in relationship with Jesus, you are going to be comfortable with things happening because He will make things happen. He will save souls. He will heal diseases. And church, don't be shocked if He raises the dead again because that's what Jesus does. Amen. 
Now, verse 19. They took Paul, <coughs> brought him to... Somebody say that word. Sounds good to me. But anyhow, they brought Paul there and said, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Curiosity. Verse 20 says, For you bring certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And then Paul stood up in the midst of Mars Hill and he said, You men of Athens. Y'all remember how the Apostle Peter preached on the day of Pentecost? Well, the Apostle Paul now is standing up right in the midst of Athens where all of their temples and shrines and idols are and he begins to say these words to them. He said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things that you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription this inscription said, To the unknown God. Well, as I said before, Athens was famous for labeling gods of all sorts and sizes and shapes and from all kinds of places in the universe. They had their God's name. They had a Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and just, I mean, they had gods everywhere, but, you know, to kind of do the cleanup on the worship, they said, we need an altar for an unknown God, just in case we missed one. <coughs> well, they really missed one. Paul said, Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, Him declare, Him I declare to you. Now I like this. Y'all grab hold of this little message Paul's preaching. He says, God that made the world and He made all the things that are in the world, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, He dwelleth not in temples that are made with hands. Neither is He worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing that he giveth life to all. Kind of like what God said to David. David, you want to build me a house? Where are you going to put this house? Can you build a house? The heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. David, I respect the fact that you want to build me a house. But church, God cannot be contained like that. He is spirit and He is true. He giveth life to all and breath and things. How many of y'all know where the things that you have came from? Paul said that God gives them all. And he said He made one blood, all nations, men, to dwell on the earth, and He's determined the times before appointed, the bounds of their habitation. Now I like this. Verse 27, it was part of the song that we sung. That they should seek the Lord. Men should seek the Lord. If Happily, they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. How many of y'all would just like to feel after the Lord and touch Him? And even more, 
important to have Him touch you. Paul said that all men, that God has given life to all men. Church, understand this about God. He's going to be awfully hard to impress. Debbie, I want to say He is Lord. If you'll come and give me some music. Man builds wonderful, beautiful things in this world. For the last two or three weeks on Good Morning, or NBC I think it is, no, it's CBS, they've been broadcasting their morning show from the brand new building, the tower that they built in New York City that was destroyed, and they have just been up there all week admiring. And I'm sure that the architecture, phenomenal, I saw on TV not too long ago in Shanghai, China, this building that they're building that is bigger than any building that's ever been built in the world. And within the confines of this building, people are going to live, they are going to work, they're going to go to the movies, they're going to shop, they're going to go out to eat. They are not going to go outside this building. They will have gardens. They will have food. They will have artificial light and artificial air. And the reason they're building it is because in Shanghai, China, the air is so filthy and dirty they can't breathe it. So they're building this huge building structure. And it's phenomenal. They spent two hours describing the building technique and, 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 and all the things that had to be done that were really, really hard to do. Some of the most brilliant minds that there were in China designed this thing. And I don't know if they're done with it yet. But my point in saying all that is that it's going to be really hard for man to outdo God. You're not going to impress God with your building or your shrine or any structure. No, no, no. David had a wonderful palace. So did Solomon. So did Israel. And scattered all over the world, there are still temples and shrines and churches. My, they're monumental in their size. I heard one time that I don't know how true this is or not, but I heard one time that Roger Miller, he was a country singer, he's dead now, but years ago, he and I think it might have been Willie Nelson were riding along and somewhere through the country together. It was evening and the sunset. And the beauty of the landscape was just absolutely phenomenal. And they were talking about how beautiful the creation was. And I think Roger Miller said, my goodness, can you imagine what God could have done if you'd had money? Church, God don't need money. He don't need anything from man. He's not looking for anything from man. You see, God don't dwell in temples that are made with men's hands. God dwells in temples like you and like me. And church, His design on you is to dwell in you eternally and let you enjoy Him. Amen. Wouldn't you like to enjoy Jesus a little bit tonight? Let's stand and sing He is.